Cincinnati area, uh, Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky, uh, southeastern or southwestern Indiana, southeastern Indiana. Uh, and uh, he has also uh, done a lot of work on uh, the beginnings of predation uh, among the. Uh, yesterday we uh, we had uh, predators of the sea, which was basically Dunkleosteus. Well, when you go back to the beginnings, everything started there. So uh, we're going to start the ocean again today. And uh, Carl will tell us about early predators. Carl? Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. We'll have to take down our high-tech <laughs> slide thing. Here's a book you can look at if you're interested on predator-prey relationships in the fossil record. We have a chapter or two in. So, yeah, it's uh, great to be here to talk about a subject that's been of interest to me for a long time, really since I was a kid, and found uh, what I thought were, may have been, uh, evidence for predation. Uh, you can see what I've done here, with apologies, sort of, to Dave, uh, but uh, it's also an advertisement for that wonderful book, Fish... Uh, sea Without Fish, and the, the, the very night by Dave Meyer, my colleague from Cincinnati, and uh, by uh, Richard Davis. And, of course, this lovely painting by John Agnew shows a scene from the Ordovician that's uh, reconstructed from the wonderful fossils of the Cincinnati area. They chose uh, an interesting title for this book, A Sea Without Fish, but uh, I found that a very intriguing notion. One might think, well, if you've got no fish, no predators, fish, at least you would probably think in the Paleozoic era, would be the main predators. But at this time, there were few fish, and there were none in this area. But that doesn't mean there weren't predators. And today what I want to talk about is uh, what it's like <laughs> to be um, a predator in the times before and after there were fish, what it was like to be prey in those times as well. So. I've sort of taken this uh, liberty of, of making the title this way, making a killing in ancient seas with and without fish. You can see several possible predators in this scene, including the, the nice cephalopod somewhere. I've got a better pointer rather than my digital pointer. But uh, the, uh, <clears throat> you can see these nice nautiloid cephalopods. Trilobites may have been predators. Sea stars or starfish were predators. Predation is just one of a number of different types of interactions that exist within uh, marine communities or within any community. And here are some other ones. We, don't, we won't go through them exhaustively, but ecologists often symbolize them using these zero, plus, and minus sort of signs to indicate the effect on the two organisms. And you can see, for example, competition it comes out ecologically as a double negative because it's a, a, a drain of energy of both competitors. Mutualism in the best of worlds is two organisms helping each other, like the <coughs> symbionts uh, algae that live in corals and help the corals, and the corals help them. There are two uh, interactions that we symbolize with a plus minus, meaning they're favorable to one organism and have a detrimental effect on the other, and those are parasitism and predation. And of course, in, in both cases, there is uh, a, a positive impact on the organism which is getting food from the other one, and uh, certainly a distinctly negative one in the case of uh, in both cases, but especially predation since the animal is eaten. Um, sometimes it's hard to distinguish those two, by the way, in the fossil record, and I'll show you examples where it might be a little ambiguous which, which, it was, which was going on. Some starting ideas for this uh, are that predation, just by definition, is the killing and consumption of animals, of prey by other animals. Predators have existed in marine systems, not on land, but in marine systems for at least half a billion years, perhaps earlier, although it's a little difficult to get the uh, evidence. And I think many people would argue that pred predators are among the keystone animals in complex food chains and webs, both in terrestrial and marine environments. In other words, they may help to control suites of other organisms, and it's been found in some areas that removal of marine predators like sea stars may have a detrimental effect on the diversity of animals uh, because of competition, actually, because other certain organisms may outcompete others and uh, crowd out others for space, but predators keep things more in check sometimes. So they do have a positive impact on communities as a whole many times, 
And finally, I think we can say that predation has probably been a critical force in evolution. Darwin certainly thought so, and I think there's lots of reasons to believe that predators and prey co-evolve in a kind of arms race, which, although it's not gradual and steady the way Darwin thought, but is nonetheless a kind of progression which occurs stepwise, and we'll talk about some of those steps. Just to remind you of the geologic time scale, I'll put it up a few more times in case you don't have it all in memory, like our students should. Uh, this is the geologic time scale with a few key players shown. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Paleozoic era today, which is roughly from about 543 to 250 or 251 million years ago. And it includes the periods Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Carboniferous, or Mississippi and Pennsylvania in our country, and Permian. Then comes the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. A lot of times I think when people think of predators, they're thinking of, of animals like uh, cats or uh, other types of large mammalian predators. Possibly even humans might be on their list, but as we go further back, of course, dinosaurian predators and pre-dinosaurian reptile predators and so on. I'm not going to talk about those today, although they're a very fascinating group, nor even talk about the animals that coexisted with, say, dinosaurs in the seas, like big mosasaurs, ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs. Those were very interesting animals, and indeed predation was very important in the Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras. But as, uh, as advertised, I'm going to talk more about some of the origins and early development of predation, particularly because we have in our local rocks evidence for some of these things that we can garner just, just by going out in the field. And I think it's also very important to think about the beginnings of, of anything. Some key questions we would ask about predation are who were the predators, what were the first predators, and some of the late, uh, later Paleozoic ones. Is there evidence in the fossil record for predation directly or indirectly? Did predation intensify through time? Did it get stronger and, and uh, the links more vicious, so you might say? And did, how, then, did prey respond to the evolution of what some people call escalation of predators, this possibility of a, an arms race between predator and prey? Well, the evidence for predators comes largely from looking at their parts, their morphology, like the claws of this Eurypterid, which look great formidable, or from what we know about their modern analogs, like this nautiloid, where we, we understand these by comparing with modern cephalopods, squids, octopus, nautilus, and know how they fed and make inferences. Likewise for these snails, which look innocuous enough, but based on, relative, uh, on information from modern relatives, we have uh, a good suggestion that these were predators, even as far back as the Paleozoic, at least some snails were. Trilobites themselves were both predators and prey. The other thing is not only evidence for predators by their structure or by comparing them with the modern relatives, but evidence for predation directly, what we call predignia. But ichnia is just a fancy word for traces, and I think you can put that word together. Predation traces, trace fossils, that show breakage by gnawing, biting, boring, and so on. Here you can see a famous one that I won't discuss more, but showing uh, possible tooth marks from a mosasaur. That's questioned by some, but looks like double row of teeth. And uh, predatory boreholes, I'll talk more about. Bite marks and a tail of a trilobite. These are direct or somewhat indirect, but a more direct evidence for uh, predation. Okay, now I want to go back again and look just prior to the Paleozoic, just for a moment. And here we get back into time around 560, 570 million years ago. And uh, a time which a friend of ours, Mark McMenamin, nicknamed the Garden of Ediacara. This is called the Ediacaran period after some sandstone bodies in the Ediacaran hills of Australia, which were among the first rocks to yield these remarkable things. They're about as big as shown on the screen. They look kind of like sea pens and jellyfish uh, and perhaps some other little crawling animals down on the bottom. But the reason that Mark called this uh, the Garden of Ediacara is that, as best we can tell, there were no major large-scale predators. There may have been some little things that drilled. Uh, there were grazing animals. We think that's for sure. Uh, even some evidence that they grazed bacterial mats with their little rasping tongues, their snail relatives perhaps, Gimbarella. But 
no predators, and this is one reason we get such good preservation from these times, no predators or scavengers in part. That's the precursor. By the time we're into the Cambrian, though, things had started to certainly heat up. And for one thing, we see the Great Cambrian explosion of animals with skeletons. And I think here, the effect is so pervasive that we may forget that here is a wonderful possible link to predation. Why did organisms suddenly develop skeletons? Everything from trilobites to mollusks, brachiopods, echinoderms, within just 10 million years. 